Hi folks, I'm Jack Kennedy. Welcome to this special Dairy Link Ireland webinar on animal breeding. Um, the, first of all, the first thing I want to do is to shout out to our supporters that are involved in the programme, and that is MSD Animal Health, Lakeland Dairies, AFBI, Chagask and Caffrey in Northern Ireland. Um, I'm delighted today to be joined by four special guests, three in fact, including myself. So the first one is Joe Patton, a dairy specialist with Chagask, James Martin, a farmer from Drummond T, County Armagh, and Aidan Cushnahan, the Dairy Link Ireland advisor. So the objective of today's uh, webinar, I suppose, is first of all, to kind of have a, it's breeding is the focus. We had an animal health webinar, and this one is specifically on breeding. So the, 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 couple, the couple of objectives that we'd like to kind of try and tease through and have a discussion today are around examining the role that sire selection plays in affecting animal performance. We're going to take some of the data from James Martin's farm who were, who were, um, who were focusing on today. D James and Owen are part of the, of a, of the Dairy Link project. They're working with Aidan um, on, the, on the Dairy Link project. Um, we want to make reference, obviously, to some of the research and some of the work that's ongoing, I suppose, in Caffrey and in Chavisk. Um, it's a kind of a, it's a cross-border uh, collaboration, so it's north and south and what the messages are, uh, we can discuss. And then I suppose some of the, we'll finish up with some of the factors in terms of to consider um, on-sire selection in advance of the start of autumn breeding, which is, which is kind of in the, in, going to be in the, next, in the next month or two to give guys a, a feel for what's happening there. Um, James, I mean to, to give us a to give us a little bit of an introduction to your to your farm. Maybe tell us a little bit about what you're doing. It's, you're slightly unusual in that the cows are in in all year round. Uh, yeah, we started keeping the cows in in 2012. Uh, a couple of reasons I was there, really just due to the weather, labour, and uh, there's no room to expand the uh, cows in the system. The uh, grazing platform it was very fragmented. And uh, also we had bred a cow with a certain genetic potential. We didn't really think that we were realizing what she could do. Yeah, so that's 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 pretty much it, as you say. So you're 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 milking 160 uh, Holstein Friesian cows. It's kind of it's high input, it's high output. We'll come to some of the numbers, I suppose. Uh, but it's I mean it's high input, high output, and, and effectively you're looking to to push to push volume, isn't 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 that what you're doing? And now you're maybe thinking about considering trying to push more milk components in terms of more fat and protein. Isn't that the kind of, that's where you are. Aidan, I mean, the, the, the slide we have up here at the moment shows the, the, the annual herd performance. This is, this is the most recent figures in terms of, uh, I suppose, milk performance. And we wouldn't measure there in terms of margin over concentrate in terms of the, the different type of herds that, you know, that, uh, you know, many farmers will know about. James's herd will say we have his numbers. Caffrey benchmarking and the Caffrey, um, the Caffrey dairy herd. It's not to compare between these three, but just to give us a feel, maybe let's go through some of the numbers in terms of what we're looking at here. Certainly, Jack. Um, hello there, everybody. Uh, basically, what you're looking at there are a summary of some of the physical performance uh, factors for Owen and James's herd and how the, their perform in relation to uh, corresponding figures recorded on Caffrey benchmarking farms and for that matter in the Caffrey dairy herd. Uh, James has already highlighted there that they're operating a high input, high output system. And you can see that in the figures, you know, in terms of milk yield and concentrate in relation to what the other uh, fact sectors are doing there. Their average rolling annual milk yield currently is in around 9,700 litres. Uh, Caffrey Dairy Herd doing a little under 8,900 litres. Uh, 100 or so Caffrey Benchmark Farms to date doing about 7,900 litres. And that's reflected in the milk solids as well. You can see they are producing that bit more milk solids on account of the fact of that volume. Uh, but one of the things we've, we've noticed in reviewing the data is that the milk components there in comparison in terms of butter, fat and protein content would be that wee bit lower. And we feel it's something that could generate potential extra revenue given the volume of milk that that's producing. I suppose the other thing maybe just to highlight that, that this figure is quite a high figure in relation to what is experienced in the Northern Ireland dairy industry. Now, James, do you want to comment on anything like that? You know, how many times a day are those cows being milked, for example? Um, yeah, just sell us milking twice a day. Um, we have started to realise that we think we push them as far as we can with the milk yield that we're getting out of twice a day milking. Um, I think to really push on, I think we'll probably have to start three times a day milking, and that's not something that we would really want to do. Uh, the next thing that we're probably trying to do is maybe 
increase the butter fat and protein. There's an increase in the value of milk, maybe realize that greater milk price for the milk that we're producing. I mean, Joe, just to bring you in from the outside in terms of like, you're looking at these numbers, like we say, I'm, I'm looking at the, the Caffrey dairy here, their performance, 60, 80 kilos of milk solids. I mean, you know, on, on less feed, we'll say, um, and they just have higher solids. So they're bringing more solids to the party, we'll say for kind of for less volume compared to, compared to James's farm, we'll say. Yeah, well, you're talking about a thousand litres, um, a thousand litres less yield, uh, Jack. Uh, but I suppose we, we need to be looking at that in terms of milk revenue as well. Is the it's not just the milk lit, the headline milk litres, it's the it's the price per litre as well. I think that's so it's milk revenue per cow we should really be looking at rather than just the headline figure in litres. But you know, obviously Owen and James very impressive, nine seven on a twice a day system. Uh, given seven twelve kilos of milk solids, so I suppose the question becomes then: Can that be increased? Maybe, but can we get more milk solids out? Maybe by holding the milk yield, uh, and maybe not fall into that idea that we need to trade one for the other. But certainly, if you're looking at the 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 Caffrey herd at three point four and four point one on a black and white herd, it does show that there's good promise there for increasing um, increasing solids percentages across the board for Northern Ireland farms. I think, yeah. Um. Okay, James, I mean, just again, coming back to you and your farm, I mean, you've picked out a couple of individual cows here in terms of, of you know, are these the type of cows that you like or that you have or that you want more of? Or just, just kind of talk us through what we're going to be, I think there's two, there's two cows coming up here. Yeah, uh, well, this is a second occasion cow. She's a uh, racing black and calf to sex semen. Um, yeah, that, to be honest, that's my type of cows, given that sort of milk yield and that butter fat and protein. Healthy cow, good in her uh, feet and legs, and was functional. A cow that I don't really notice in the herd, but is able to come in and do it every day. Um, that second cow, that white cow? Yeah, yeah. She has, this is a first lactation heifer. She's just going dry, and her, she has given a fantastic amount of milk for a first lactation heifer. And again, she's back in calf, going dry. Um, see her protein, or she. Very good butter fat and very happy with that, but protein wee bit low and to be honest, I'm not really worried with that, but the milk solids that she is producing and the fact that she's just that just uh, that would be the sort of cow for our farm. That'd be the desire because we're trying to breed. Yeah. Now just, just so just to be clear, like I mean she she is negative, we'll say on her, her PTA for protein percentage is negative. Um, but she has a high milk volume, she's coming with 500 kilos of, of, of breeding ability in terms of, of milk volume, you know, so, I mean, she has huge volume, like, I mean, as a second lactation doing 11,200 kilos, like, I mean, yeah. it's, irrespective of what feed you get, so, like, it's, it's absolutely huge volume, you know, I mean. So that's the first lactation happen, so that's. First lactation, sorry, yeah. 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 So, so, but, and, but, and James, would do you see her lasting in, 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 in your system, in your herd? Like, I mean, will, like, or, or kind of talk to me about fertility, how important it is and kind of how, you know, lifetime performance rather than kind of annual performance. Well, that's it. Like, well, the cows that last, like, like, for, like she's already bad calf. She went in the calf to sex team and she had two services and she went back to calf to sex team. She's going dry. She's um, 298 days in milk. I think she's going dry now, but six weeks. She's... Brilliant condition, good feet and legs, and um, brilliant confirmation. There's nice tight order on her. Like that's to me, that's a cow that will last. If we manage it right, I think that cow will last. Mm. So, um, I mean, to, to talk about kind of, I suppose the the value of solids. I mean, Aidan, you you put together this this table showing kind of, you know, I mean, is it worth James as while trying to get solids up effectively? Isn't that what this table is about? Yes, Jack. Well, James on this far, and, and Owen and I have had a discussion about this over the last number of weeks, and, and James has does milk record, so we have that information that we can base some decisions on. What you're looking at here are the performance data again from first lactation heifers last year, in terms of solid production, where we've compared the top 25% of those animals against uh, the bottom 25%. Um, and I've inserted in there PTAs are protected transmitting abilities for butter fat and protein protect production and estimated a milk value for each group. So you can see top 25% in terms of volume, uh, in terms of volume of milk there, are producing around 850 litres less than the bottom 25%. But they have that ability to produce more fat and protein and it's coming through 
and then product and up there averaging 40 kilos per cow more solid yield than the bottom 25 percent and when you apply a base price of 25 and a half pence a litre and the bonus penalty system that exists within Lakeland Dairies for fat and protein production, um, you get you see the figures that at the bottom of the table that they're they're quite similar in, in between both groups. So what we've been looking at is to see how can we apply that across the board and improve the milk solid yield for all cows within the herd. Okay, rather than just looking at the bottom twenty five percent and the and the top twenty five percent, like yeah, um, yeah. Um, so 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 just 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 so I'm clear here now. Like I mean, in terms of the bottom twenty five percent, they're a lot higher volume. They they've produced about six sixty kilos of milk solids. They've lower uh, breeding ability in terms of fat and protein, and the net milk value based on the current structure, it, it comes into a, a revenue. Uh, of kind of 2,346, like, um, whereas the top 25%, they're lower volume, so there's 8,200, so they again dropped that 900 or, or 1,000 litres, they're producing, you know, 40 kilos more milk solids, um, better ability for breeding in terms of fat and protein, but there, there wasn't a whole lot of extra pounds per cow difference in terms of the, of the milk value, uh, even though there's 40 kilos of milk solids for less volume. So the discount on the volume is not taking it down, kind of, is not taking the value off it, um, Aidan. Is, is that what I'm seeing? I think, yes, Jack. I think that's it. James alluded earlier on that he's, he's trying to uh, increase milk value in terms of the milk price there. And when you look at, at the extra milk solids there, it's significantly increased the actual price paid per litre in comparison to what was going on with the bottom 25%. And that, that's essentially why you end up with similar values there for milk value. Mm -hmm. Joe, any any view on that? Obviously, a lot of your clients in the ROI, the, the A plus B minus C system would make the, the, the you know the, the the lower volume, higher milk solids animals more valuable. You know, I mean mm. that that system obviously isn't in play in the in the in the North Ireland. Yeah, well, if you take there, Jack, what are you talking? Um, sixty, you're talking forty kilos of milk solids. So there's a couple of hundred quid a cow. There would be a couple of hundred quid a cow at least difference in milk revenue. Uh, for the top 25 percent because we would ultimately this milk has been dried down it's it's turned into product it's turned into a dried product you know it's not um it's not liquid milk as such so it's a dried product so you are actually ending up in the factory with an extra 40 kilos to sell um on the on the top 25 percent there that's obviously worth that's worth money but i think at farm level too um it's important to look at it another way to say that you know, which of the two groups of cows maybe would be easier to feed as well. Like if you're looking for um, additional milk value, uh, can if you get it in, in 8,200 kilos at higher components, you know, the feed bill left behind cows like that um, might be a bit less than maybe a, certainly on the ones that are up at the 9,000 litres. So certainly like if you were running a feed to yield system, for example, the cows on the left of that table would be taking more feeds um, to, 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 to um, achieve their 2,346 value versus the uh, the cows on the right. So I think feed, you know, the feed efficiency question comes into it uh, as well. So I think in common, I think the farmers in the south are probably winning on the basis of higher milk, milk value overall, plus the saving and feed cost. But even in the Northern Ireland payment structure, you would argue that, you know, still the, the cows on the right hand side are still more uh, they're, they're still creating bigger milk revenue, but just not, it's not as visible, I suppose, as, as we might see. Yeah, I hear you. So, I mean, two good points. I mean, effectively, you're saying that this is one part of it, but there's two other legs to the stool, the industry piece in terms of less volume, less water to, yeah. pump up, to dry off, and two, the feed costs associated with producing that extra, extra litres, like that James, by James Martin, uh, he, he doesn't see that on, in, on an individual cow basis or on a quartile basis or whatever, and that's important to kind of um, keep in mind. Okay. Um, no, I, I think that's clear. I mean, Joe, to stay with you in terms of, you know, I mean, EBI and, and the differences, I suppose, that that, that that brings to the party. Obviously, a lot of farmers in Northern Ireland, it's PLI, they're selecting um, their, their, their sires on. I mean, just, just talk to us, I suppose, in terms of EBI and in terms of this slide that you have here in terms of cows and ace lakeland herds ranked on EBI. Yeah. Okay, Jack, I suppose, yeah, look, whether it's PLI or EBI, I suppose the, the question really is, you know, does breeding for extra fertility and extra solids actually deliver in whichever system you're looking at? So what we looked at here was, um, it was just data across eight Lakeland herds that would have been at maybe at the higher end of the scale over the 520 kilos of milk solids scale. Um, 
some of them really, maybe some of these herds not, you know, not very actively pushing for EBI, but maybe keeping an eye on it. And what we did was we went in and looked at, we basically ranked the cows within those herds based on their, their EBI from high to low into, into different quarters, okay? And what we really saw was, just to follow it there, the highest EBI group was 137 back to negative nine for the lowest now, there'd be, there'd be high and low cows within every herd. So, I mean, the, 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 the issue of herd management and all that is taken out of this. And I think that's important to, 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 to recognize as well. Sometimes we give all the credit to the breeding, when there's management issues there as well. But anyway, look, what we saw when we, when we ranked them this way, based across these number of herds, we actually saw that the highest EBI group was delivering significantly more milk value um, than the lower EBI group, even though, and if you can see it there in the in the milk kilos PD, that's the milk kilos in the proof. There were lower milk kilos than the um, they were lower in milk volume than the, than the than the lowest EBI group, but because they had higher solids percentages and because they had better fertility overall, they ended up delivering more milk value uh, per per year. So five eighty kilos of milk solids or five eighty six mil- kilos of milk solids versus five thirty six. Very similar kilos of milk, uh, even though their genetics for milk was the same, very similar kilos actually delivered, but their protein and fat was higher at, at 425, 353 versus 381, 329. When we added all that up, the higher EBI uh, cows were basically, if you took 100 cows of each, from the highest and lowest, the, the 100 cows uh, with the lowest EBI were delivering about 19, 18,000, 19,000 less milk value than the higher EBI group. Now that was over over a number of herds. And I suppose I should say as well, Jack, that within that, within that uh, small, uh, within that small study or within that uh, small project, there were herds in there delivering up to 700 kilos of milk solids. And when we looked at that data within herd for each of those, the, the, the rankings came out pretty similar. So the higher EBI cows calved more, you know, the calved once a year, higher solids, um, and outperformed the, the sort of milkier herd mates that, that was that was standing beside them basically. So that was it was quite a quite quite a, a clear picture of what was happening on the ground. I think. And, and Joe, would you would you be comfortable that the same kind of piece would would work for PLI? You know, in terms of if you were to break it down. I, I, I think I think so. I think look, the, the, the big thing with any of these indices is, you know, does the does the index, we can argue up and down about the weightings in the index and all the rest of it, Jack, but I think what we have to the question we have to ask is, does the index deliver what it's supposed to? So we we set out, I suppose, as an industry 20 years ago to say we wanted an index that rewarded higher milk composition and better fertility, right? And if we look at the de- the data that we have we're saying that that happens. We can see certainly on the, the more extreme for EBI will outperform the, the, the lower ones. Can the same happen on PLI? I suppose it can for, for sure. There's, there's good, you know, there's good data from, from, um, from the UK to show that. But I suppose what we need to be clear on here is that when we looked at our EBI, we were selecting for quite, you know, we were selecting quite strongly for solids and selecting quite strongly fertility, for fertility within the index. You know, no index is going to deliver anything unless we select strongly for the traits that we want to improve. So we can we can talk about PLI and talk about EBI all we want, but unless we start, you know, really going after the highest solids bulls or the highest fertility bulls within the index, we're we're, we're not going to see maybe the progress that we we would like. Uh, James, I mean, this kind of leads back to you in terms of what you want to do for for your farm in terms of and how you use the information. Uh, I mean, you, you're obviously milk recording, um, and and can you maybe just talk through how how kind of you use that information to select the type of cows, and hence then match the type of sires that you that you need? Like, to be honest, we really would just three or four things that whenever we're picking a sire, we would really look at. Probably number one would be maybe type for Teddy. We kind of be simple from the perspective, maybe selling heifers. That market, like, um, for fertility probably would be next, and then we would keep an eye on milk yield. We wouldn't really like using a bottle that would be less than 500 kilos of milk. Um, we would find it's a little bit difficult to get bottles at over 500 kilos, but still have the fat and protein. And this last number of years, we have been constantly making the decision to put breeding or breeding cows with higher levels of fat and protein. Um, we would look at a lot of other things like um, 
mm-hmm. confirmation of the cow, like the udder or mammary, um, legs and feet, teeth, teeth length. Uh, so it's a lot of different things go into it. Yeah, I, I, yeah, exactly. And I suppose this is this is the kind of what I'm getting through and what I'm hearing from Joe in terms of like Joe, if if, if you want to make improvement in a particular area, you have to put a focus onto it. You know the kind of a way I say it. You know, I mean put it in as a mix with four or five other elements, it's probably, you probably won't get a whole lot of shift or it'll take a lot longer to make a shift for on a hard basis. Like, is that fair to say, Joe? It is, it is fair to say, Jack. Now, I know I can fully understand where James is coming from. He doesn't want to lose maybe the, you know, the strong traits he has in terms of type already and doesn't want to maybe go backwards in some of them when making progress in the solid. So that, that's understandable. But I think... Uh, listening to this and listening to a lot of you know listen to maybe a lot of farms our own um maybe more in the winter milk sector for ourselves and maybe some farms in northern ireland that i'd be talking to quite a bit as well there is that issue and maybe Aidan, you might come to it at some point is the is the the question around the kilos of milk question you know and people putting in a requirement for um a certain kilos of milk and not maybe selecting below that right so i think james said there 500 kilos of milk is the minimum they would use. But like, if you look at maybe the Caffrey herd, and maybe that's common, is to, to look at where for the 9,000 kilos that they're delivering, is 500 kilos necessary? And maybe even for James and, and Owen's herd as well, is you know is 500 kilos of milk actually necessary? Like that might be the slide there. If you look at that slide, um, uh, Aidan, and you might come in on this too, that the PTA at the moment in the herd for, for the lads there is 120 kilos, right? So... Um, and for the Caffrey herd, it's minus actually. So there's a negative weighting on milk yield within the Caffrey herd delivering close to 9,000 kilos. And I'd say that's probably going to be a surprise to a lot of people within the Northern Ireland industry to see that, that actually the what is a very, very good herd of cows is doing, you know, is doing that with a minus figure in front of its, its PTA for milk. So I think I'm not saying that people should be selected negatively for milk. That's not what I, what we're about here. But what I am saying is that if you put the requirement of 500 kilos into your selection criteria, you exclude all the bulls below that. And an awful lot of the bulls below that might be ones that could improve fertility, could improve solids and could still have very, very good type. Do you know what I'm trying to get at, Jack? So I think the 500 kilo thing or setting a, a figure for, for milk can, can sometimes exclude an awful lot of the bulls that would make a very, very good job on the herd. And if you look at, like, there again, there's the figure, 121 kilos. So, like, if the lads kept the bulls close to that figure, or, you know, not much with it, they're going to hold their milk yield, and it will give them an awful lot of scope for, for improving the other traits as well. I mean, Aidan, to bring you in on it, like, I mean, you were impressed with the... Like you, you, a lot, you know a lot of farmers in Northern Ireland, you work with a lot of farmers in Northern Ireland, but you were impressed with the Martins in terms of the genetic report that they had and, you know, the information that they have so that you actually, so that we can actually look at these numbers and can compare them. Like. Oh, absolutely, Jack. Look, if, you, if you're serious about trying to make inroads in, ter- in terms of a genetic improvement, you need to have a third genetic report. Um, Owen and James had this information to hand. Um, and, and you can see the figures are there that you know that that just to explain that PTA for milk of plus one two one basically what that means is the average cow and in, in their herd is genetically capable of passing on 121 kilos of milk more than the baseline heifer ever under the current system, and likewise, uh, while those PTAs for butter, fat, and protein may appear to be lower than what's be, being shown there in the Caffrey herd. Uh, Caffrey Dairy Herd basically took this decision a number of years ago, and, and, and you're looking at, at what, what's been done over a number of years, uh, and uh, James and the one just maybe just haven't quite got to that stage. Uh, uh, James didn't mention it. To be fair, James, it's, uh, you know, you might want to comment. Some of the bulls you have used over the last number of years uh, have had quite a strong positive deviation for butter fat, for fat. Isn't that correct? Yeah, a couple of bulls even our last year, like there was maybe like an Agronaut or Mardi Gras, like there were they did have lower levels of milk and gradients as far as fat and protein and better fertility. And you know, if cows in the ground other than bulls, and we're, we'll be very happy with them. Like we would be maybe inclined to maybe use them bulls again, maybe in the future. So mm. I think, um, I think Joe's, Joe's point as well, just about the, the milk. I, I, there is a, maybe a perception that you feel a, a negative figure may, may seriously impact on the milk yield. Uh, but we'll, we'll have another slide maybe to show what potentially crossing a low milk yield bull with, with a cow, what impact that actually has in the breeding values on down the line. I know, but it's, 
it, you know, that negative value doesn't, uh, when you see what the Caffrey dairy herd are doing, isn't having a serious impact on their milk yield at this stage. Talk to me on, on, on this particular slide. Like, so this, this, this is data from the Martin herd show. So each dot represents a cow yield, yeah? Am I right? And effectively you're looking at um, the actual yield in terms of kilos. Um, and you're looking at the, the breeding figure for milk yield, we'll say across. So just 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 talk us through what this what we're looking at here and what, what kind of what's the message from it. Okay, briefly, Jack. The background to this is because Owen and James are milk recording, and James is actually submitting details of the sars you know, used in the herd when calves are being registered. Um, there are PTAs being generated for each animal in the herd, and at the end of each lactation, uh, then. Uh, that, that performs to summarize in per, terms of the cow PTA for a specific parameter on how much that animal is actually produced during the course of her lactation. So what I've attempted to do in this graph here is summarize the relationship between cow PTA for milk yield and the one in James's herd and the actual milk yield achieved over 305 days. So each of those points represents a cow in the herd. The solid line is what the computer has attempted to do in terms of producing a best fit line to, to through those points. And the R squared on the right hand side describes the strength of the relationship of that in terms of zero being no relationship and one being a very strong relationship. Now, a value of 0 0.05 is a very, very weak relationship, which at first glance would maybe appear to suggest that there is no relationship between breeding for milk yield here and uh, the actual milk yield achieved. That's not the case. You know, look, milk yield wouldn't have increased to the extent that it has over the last 30 years if we hadn't had changes in breeding policy. But it is tying in with what James alluded to earlier on, and that they have produced a population of cows there that, genetically speaking, are physically capable of producing a lot, a lot of milk. And they're at a stage where they're not so sure where they want to push that any further. And they're looking at our avenues to try and improve the milk revenue generated by those cows. Joe, I don't know if there's anything you maybe want to say at this point. Yeah, I suppose maybe the thing in just look at that again, it's really that at, as it stands, if you look there, the range, like if you take at a 200 or 300 kilos of milk in the proof, the range is anywhere from sort of 7,000 kilos up to 12,000 12, kilos, I suppose. So there's a big, big range in and around that, anywhere from sort of 100 to 300 kilos. So I suppose you could look at that another way and say that it's, it's not PTA for milk, that's limiting production at the moment on the farm for individual cows. It's probably more likely to be issues like um, days in milk, for example, calving interval, um, some of the health traits perhaps. So PTA itself is not the main limiting factor uh, in terms of what output the cows are achieving. So I suppose, Jack, that's what we'd be saying. If it's not your main limiting factor to, to output, it probably shouldn't be top of the list in terms of your, um, it shouldn't be top of your list in terms of selection criteria either. As long as they keep a good baseline or herds like this, keep a good baseline in their milk yield potential, uh, they're not going to lose milk but, and still have loads of scope to maybe improve the other traits as well. Okay. Yeah, look, at it, 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 we won't get, I mean, it's very scientific and, and, and it's, it's, it's deep, you know, but I mean, it, I think it, we get the message. I mean, the, the, it comes across here again in the protein piece, isn't it? In, this, yeah. is, this is similar. This yeah. is similar. Your R squared is better, so there's a better correlation, we'll say, with the breeding for protein and actual protein delivered. So just, again, just these are these are actual herd dots or actual, actual uh, protein deliveries in individual cows in the Martin herd. Yes, we, we, Jack, we carried out the same exercise for actually for both butter fat and protein, but I've just put the protein up here uh, by means of illustration. Each of those dots represents a cow on Owen and James's herd there. The, the figures along the bottom axis uh, represent cow PTA for uh, protein production, and the figures, the vertical axis, represent the actual protein achieved by those cows. And you can see the R squared value in this, this case is quite a bit higher than what we saw in the last slide. So, you know, bear in mind, this is just raw data. It hasn't been subjected to any scientific analysis, but it would suggest there is something going on there in terms of cows with a higher potential to produce milk protein are actually doing that. And by coincidence, the same thing was observed when, when we did that exercise for butterfat percentage as well. Uh, yeah, if anything, I mean, it, so it, it is no coincidence. I mean, we can we have a good measure on milk yield and milk performance, and hence we have a, I suppose, the heritability of it is strong. So you can you can influence the milk yield components 
fairly strongly, isn't it? Isn't, isn't, and that's what James is doing when he's looking at his microcard and Joe and looking at his performance. Like he's selecting his best cows to breed his best and put the sires on those to breed better, better cows. Yeah. Like, I mean, that's what it's about. Well, it really shows, Jack, if you breed for protein and fat, you're going to get protein and fat. But if you breed for extra milk, you may not actually get extra milk because it may not be milk. It may not be genetics for milk that's holding you back, if you get me. So uh, I think it's a very strong message there that if there's a good baseline kept on the on the on the volume, uh, you don't have to go crazy on it. You can really make strides by by selecting strongly for 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 PTA for protein percent mm. and for fat percent as well. So just let's let me bottom out in this in my head that I mean, as you say, in, in terms of milk yield, there's other factors that can influence it. Um, you know, the likes of management, the likes of calving days, the likes of fertility, etc. They, they can influence um, milk yield. So that's why you were seeing the, a poor, uh, you know, correlation with say in this particular one. I mean, yeah. whereas in the in the protein, it, it's more def definitive that you get you if you breathe for higher protein and fat, you you get it. You're going to get that every day of the year, if you get me. Whereas, you know, you start with you start with two groups of cows, for example, that have one for high milk yield and one for low milk yield uh, in terms of their breeding potential. Uh, it depends on how you, it really depends on the volume of feed that goes in there. It depends on the fertility. Like over time, I would say that your first lactation yields might look different, but over time as the herd, as the circumstances change and calving dates begin to shift due to fertility and all the rest of it, there may differences will come into it. So there's definitely more noise in there. And that's not unique to that's not unique to James and Owen's herd at all. Like that, we would see that across a number of herds that we've looked at over the years at high and low milk yield, actually, because you know, an awful lot of it's down to the to the feeding regime as well. But at high and low milk yield, you can see something very, very similar. However, when you look at it within the the same exercise across a lot of herds for the for the milk composition you certainly can see um you can certainly see the effect that genetics can have so really if you're looking at that you're saying if you want to get your best response to terms of um milk solids output chasing the percentages is, is a very important thing to do james i mean we at the start we kind of talked about kind of your objectives in terms of the herd i mean we can see from this this particular uh, graph that like i mean you have a lot of of your herd you know well over ten thousand kilos produced in the year you know i mean again just to kind of reiterate on, on the volume side in terms of where you're coming from do, do you feel at this stage you have enough of volume in the herd and that you can you can take the maybe not take the focus off it but just keep the focus on that and and try and, and improve the solids is that is that where you're yeah. having your head yeah, it probably has, but I know we would find out if we did, if we used us lower than 500 kilos of milk, we would lose milk in the tank. I know what I know, because that really is what drives our farm here. And I've seen in the past, we found it's easier to breed for milk yield than fats and proteins. Personally, I think it's more down to feeding and external factors. Um, the way it's going now, yeah, I think there will be, the, Probably will be a shift in the way we look at breeding and maybe milk yield. Um, we have consciously been focusing on fat and protein this last number of years. Um, I think it's going to take a long time for the genetics alone yeah. just to improve. I think maybe feeding decisions or maybe the cows have been fed, it's going to have to change along with that to really see the fat and protein change in the milk diet. So you 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 mean more individual type feeding to individual cows? Is that is that where you're coming from, James? Or um, no, maybe probably fat to feeding, like better silage making, uh, maybe right. different ingredients or things them sort of that sort of lines. Okay. Okay. Um, I mean, just to just to, I, I, we've been talking about a, a lot about the, the milk side of things. I suppose the, the fertility uh, side of things. Again, James, you mentioned that you're you're, you're looking to breed sires. You're going to breed with sires that have a higher fertility index in terms of mm -hmm. uh, that that you'll you'll see better performance. I mean, Aidan, this slide of yours again j just shows you know that you know selecting for higher fertility will deliver in terms of of, of better better fertility performance. Yes, Jack. Uh, look, fertility is very much on the forefront for for every milk producer in Northern Ireland. And if you look at the SAR selection list, there is a variable in there called fertility index, which, if you select for, will have an impact on on your overall fertility. Uh, what you're looking at here is a bit of work carried out with the Caffrey Dairy Herd over a 10-year period, uh, whereby they looked at uh, the fertility index of SARS, which were used in the herd, and compared that against Calvin interval from uh, crosses produced from those SARS. 
And you can see that if you improve the fertility index from minus 15 up to plus 20 there, that the Calvin interval does in, uh, improve significantly. Uh, in fact, HDB would go as far as saying for every point increase in, in fertility index, you can improve uh, Calvin interval by 0.6 of a day. So uh, that in a sense ties into back what Joe was saying earlier on. If, you, if you're going to improve these, these variables, you need to select quite aggressive for them to make any significant inroads. Mm. And Joe, you have something similar in terms of ROI data, in terms of the, the fertility actually you know, making a difference. Yeah, that was just a little bit of work that um, that um, Stephen Butler and, and and Stephen Moore did a couple of years ago in uh, in in Moor Park, Jack, where they actually they went out and they bought in um, they bought in high fertility and low fertility genetic lines. So they went out into the market and bought the highest fertility and lowest fertility heifers they could get their hands on. Now, in this case, which was the interesting part of the study, was that the, the animals were genetically very, very similar for milk yield potential. So there were there were milky heifers in both cases, but they had the difference in their gen underlying genetics for fertility. So and they were selected only on the index. That was the that was how they were that's how they were identified out of the database. So what did they see? Like when they managed them similarly, you can see there one of the big things on the chart there that really six weeks after calving the, the high fertility ones, there was about close to 90% of them cycling of their, in their own right six weeks after calving. On the, the fertility minus cows, low fertility cows, they were less than 20% of them were cycling after, after six weeks. So straight away, you can see a difference in terms of how, the, how genetics had an effect in terms of how they returned to, to, to cycling. Uh, they had very similar milk yield actually across that study, uh, but the high fertility cows held their body condition that wee bit better, even on the same on the same diet, uh, and every you know this is something I suppose that we were asking ten years ago, kind of saying you know what is it about higher fertility genetics? What's the what's the magical thing that happens with inside in in the cow that makes her more fertile? What's the one the silver bullet if you like? And and the answer coming out of this study anyway is that there's no one single thing really is that the high fertility cows were better across the board in what they did. So they, they came cycling after calving sooner. There was a lot fewer of them had a, failed to ovulate. So there was a lot fewer of them maybe were cystic or needed a cedar, for example, or any, a, a progesterone device at all. Um, when it came to actual picking them up in heat, because they had a better hormonal profile, they had, they had stronger heats, fewer silent heats, fewer false heats. So they were easier to see in calf, actually. And once you did put them in calf, you put a straw into them, they established pregnancy better uh, because they had higher blood progesterone. So there was fewer cows slipping after maybe, you know, late embryo mortality was a lot less in them. So all of those things. So across the board, they had better functional fertility uh, with similar milk yield, actually, which was which was very interesting. So, you know, it's not I think that's important to point out that when we talk about you know, sometimes you look at the catalog and you think this is just a, a figure on a page that it does have a real it does have a real biological effect. You know, if you pick for very high fertility genetics, it does change the type of cows that you're working with. And I think a lot of guys would say, you know, and you've talked to them, too, over the years, too, Jack, that as they improve the genetics for fertility over the herd, you know, the reliance on things like scanning and the reliance on synchrony and the reliance on all the things to get the herd going in terms of fertility in, this, in the first part of the year, you get to the point where it becomes much more easy uh, from a management point of view to actually get the cows and calf. And I think that's, that has a big effect on cost as well, you know? Yeah, no, absolutely. And uh, in your, your last night here in terms of, you know, I suppose marrying all of this together in terms of the impact of, of breeding the next generation, you know, you be your predict you just just talk us through this slide and kind of what, what it means. Well, Jim's already highlighted, you know, concerns and it's not alone in that score. A lot a lot of people in the industry are all concerned about using low milk yield bulls in terms of actually having a negative impact on on subsequent production in their herd. What I'm trying to do here is illustrate what impact using a, a bull with a lower milk perceived milk yield might have on the resulting progeny. Here, for example, you can see a bull with a PTA for milk of plus 200 being crossed with that average cow from James's herd of a plus 121 kilos. The resultant heifer cross from that would have a breeding value, which amounts to the sum of those two values, which is plus 321 kilos. What does that mean? That basically means that heifer, genetically speaking, is capable of producing 321 kilos of milk more than the base heifer on the current system. And She's capable of transmitting about a half of that onto the next generation. 
So uh, there, there will be producers out there that, that well, well, should maybe consider maybe using, using some of those lower milk yield bulls if they're going to help them meet the other criteria that we're trying to encourage people to think about. Mm. Yeah, um, and that again, I suppose, leads us on nicely in terms of to, this. This this is where you are, Aidan, in terms of kind of guidelines for farmers that are thinking about selecting sires for this coming autumn breeding season, whether it's on PLI or EBI. You you set kind of certain thresholds here that now I'd say, Aidan, it's it's very easy to write down these thresholds, but I mean, obviously, you have farmers like James Martin and others would say that have particular situations on their farm that they're looking they're looking to try and to try and improve but these are your overall guidelines kind of in terms of what you what you think guys should be looking at in terms of sires is that is that right yes jack um these are criteria that basically we've set for project farmers in terms of improving uh butter fat protein percentage and fertility in their herds um and it, it, it all depends on whether they're north or south of the border, whether they're using the PLA system or the EBI system. Uh, in terms of the farmers in Northern Ireland, what we've, we've, we're try, encouraging folk to do is to look at sires that have PTA for milk greater than or equal to plus 100 kilos of milk, a protein deviation of greater than or equal to plus 0.08 percent, and the same for butter fat, and a fertility index greater than or equal to plus five days. Um, now, the EBI system, the, the values may differ slightly, but uh, essentially we're going on the same premises that we're trying to improve butter fat, protein and fertility. Now, uh, that will produce, a you can download the, a, a list of available SARS from, from the HDB at the minute and apply filters to, to get a list of SARS off that. Between, I'm just counting up here, between proven genomic and available SARS, uh, there are over just over 70 SARS meet those criteria. Um, what I haven't included in there are any any special criteria that, such as like James has already alluded to in terms of type and aspects of type, and that's when the, the list can become a lot shorter. And in some cases, and as James well knows, it's difficult in his 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 set of circumstances maybe to find a large number of sires that are going to meet all the criteria that he's trying to cover as well. Having said yeah. that, James, so we're, you know I'm looking down the list of sires that you picked there. There there are still quite a few of those sires. When those are crossed with that average uh, cow from your herd genetic report, will still produce offspring that, uh, genetically speaking, sh should improve the butter fat and protein percentage of your herd. That'll be fair comment. James? Um, yeah, yeah, we will. Uh, then we, uh, we, you can show that we were focusing on fertility and fat and protein. And uh, out of the five bulls he picked, there's uh, three of them. That meet the criteria for fat. Oh, sorry, four of them meet the criteria for fat. Yeah. One doesn't, but um, she's got brilliant fertility, and that was a bull we actually used before. And we're a couple of milk and heifers out, and we were very happy about. Three, three of those bulls, James, from what I can see, actually have a fertility index over ten. Yeah, yeah. But you, you know, if you go according to the AHDB guidelines, should should in theory have the potential to improve calving interval by six days if that cross is used significantly across the herd yeah and so and so so james I, I mean as you say i mean you you make you're making decisions for your your herd like i mean you can't make decisions for for anyone else but i mean in terms of a guideline for farmers what like what, what do you think of kind of what's on that slide in terms of pli but you know based on 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 on, on what we know and what we've discussed like i mean breeding for more fat and protein and, and more fertility. Like I mean, you, you're 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 doing that in effect. Like it, the yield one is probably the one where where you maybe I, I won't say disagree, but where you you feel that given your system, you're looking for a bit more. Am I right there? Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, you're 100 right. Yeah, um, yeah, we will be aiming for at least above the um, PTAs for butter fat and protein. Times is very hard to get them, especially the fertility. Um, we would try for fertility over 10 days, but that does that is difficult like there's very few bulls that lead up and maybe that's a help too because the amount of bulls that is on the approved listing you have to be severe in the amount of bulls you cut out and try to work it down in a manageable list that you're happy with more than anything else and each farm's different i can't speak for any farm other than my own but um apart from the milk i would i would be happy with that selection criteria 
Uh, Joe, obviously you, you're you're involved in the in the program. You're, you know, Chavez are a stakeholder in the Dairy Link program. I mean, as as a as a guide rule, again, are you are you kind of happy with with which is you what's on the screen there in terms of guidelines for, for guys picking sires that listen? There's there's four parameters here, four bullet points here that they need to just make sure their sires are 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 taken, whether it's PLI or EBI or selecting sires. I would be I would be Jack. I think we just we just want to be a bit careful here, like. What we want to do here is increase the solids. Uh, we're looking at getting the milk composition up, obviously fat and protein percent. And if you select at those levels, for, based on what I've seen from the herds across the across the program, they will increase the. You know, they're they're much higher than a lot of the herds, so they will make the difference. The fertility one will come as well. Now that's a slow burner. Like you know, you're not going to see an improvement in fertility overnight. It'll take it'll take probably maybe even into the second cross onto that type of stock to really see a difference, right? Uh, and I just think, again, funny, we always say we don't want to get too hung up on milk yield. And I think we just want to be clear what we're saying here. We are not saying to select for low milk bulls for the sake of it. And sometimes I've seen that where people go after low milk for the sake of it, but maybe the low milk bull might be brilliant anyway for anything else. What we're really saying is don't allow, you know, don't allow an insistence on high milk to, to make you... In, or to make you end up in a situation where you don't have much choice left, if you get me, Jack. That's the yeah. important point. So if you just take the heat off the selection on milk, it brings an awful lot more bulls into play. And I think that's the that's the key point. And maybe just one final thing just to say on that. Like, it's worth going back for anybody else from their own herd when they're talking and having their own head what they need for high milk production in terms of high volume. Go back in to the herd genetic reports from your own herd and look at some of your favorite cows or some of your best cows. And I bet you'll be surprised. Some of them will be negative for milk, right? And I think that's where the proof comes, actually. When you look within your own herd, you know, you're going to see some cows that are maybe ordinary enough on paper for milk production in theory. But when you look at how they're doing and how you're, you'd be happy with them in your own in your own herd. We're always, like I'm involved in the herd in, in Johnstown in, in Wexford, um, with Aidan Lawless, and we're always saying that you look back at some of these eight and nine lactation cows that have delivered over 9,000 kilos of milk in certain lactations, and you're saying, you know what, they have minus 50 for milk yield or something, and you'd say, you know, they're still bloody good cows. Like, so I just, I just be sure what we're talking about there when we're saying uh, dropping the criteria for milk. It's really a case of allowing more high solids bulls to come into the mix. That's, that's why we're saying that. Okay, no, folks. Look, it's it's been good. It's been interesting, and and like obviously we could go on for a lot longer. And I mean, I mean, if, if very quickly, if we were to kind of summarize, I mean, there's a couple there's a couple of key ones. I mean, breeding for milk solids and fertility will have a positive impact on your business. I think we're we're kind of all in that space. That listen, yes, yes, if you breed for higher fat and protein and fertility, you're going to produce more milk indirectly. Effectively, you have better fertility of cow staying in milk longer, etc., and staying in the herd longer. Long, lifetime performance is better. So, I mean, I think everyone, you know, everyone is in that space. That listen, that's that's a definite, that's a definite. Um, generate a herd genetic report. I mean, Aidan talked about James Martin and Owen and what they're doing there, and it's it's top class relative to some of the other guys he's working with. You know, that don't have that genetic report, and if you don't know where you are, you don't know where you're going to go to. So, I mean, you have to get that genetic report created for your herd, and you have to have your sire and know your cows and know what they're performing that's the only way you're going to make progress so i think i think that's absolutely essential i mean the the third one then is highlight what you want to what you want to focus on and like i mean between aid and joe and james i think we've talked enough about that in terms of we're looking for for, for milk solids fertility we're saying you know don't don't you know maybe just open up the door a little bit as joe said in terms of milky you don't let that right override the, the overall decision on the sire because that will bring a lot more sires into the party if if, if you if you leave that maybe a little bit lower um, in terms of the actual EPTA for milk yield. Um, and select sires that will insignificantly improve those traits. I mean, you, you pick the best. You don't pick the best just because the, the salesperson says this is the best one that they have on offer. So you, you pick it based on what you want for your herd to better drive your business. And, uh, and I think that's that's what we're about. I mean, obviously, on this webinar, we've just talked about the genetics around fertility, but there's a lot more in terms of fertility management, whether it's feed, whether it's, um, you know, the whole area of, you know, herd health treatment, etc., and that kind of thing that that obviously will impact on, on your business. But we've specifically focused this webinar on um, the genetics and the whole aspect that they can play in terms of better breeding on the farm. So, look, good folks, with, with that, I think I'll, I, I'll bring it to a close because we've had a, a pretty long session on it. I mean, again, shout out to our supporters, MSD Animal Health, Lakeland Dairies, AFBI, 
Chagas and Caffrey who are key to the to the fundamental running of, of this program. And and I leave with, by saying thanks to, again to Aidan Cushnahan, the Dairy Link advisor to the to the program, who's working with the farmers across Northern Ireland, Phase One and Phase Two farmers. Joe Patton, who's obviously working uh, full time with Chagas, but obviously sits in and helps us with the stakeholder in terms of uh, the Dairy Link running of this of this particular program. And James Martin and Owen, his father Owen in Drummond Tea in County Armagh, who've been you know very good to participate in this and show their show their show their performance and show their figures and and and, and what it is in their particular system, which is milking twice a day um, and keeping the cows in all year round um, on good. So, folks, we'll leave it at that. Um, thanks for that, and uh, we'll be back again with more Dairy Link messages in the coming weeks.